Before you can begin to understand the basics of good object-oriented design, you'll need to understand the basics of object-oriented programming. In this video, I'll give an overview of the key ideas behind object-oriented programming. So in this video, we're going to take the opportunity to examine some object-oriented programming fundamentals that you should understand before you delve into object-oriented design. So first up, what is object-oriented programming? Well, it stresses the creation and interaction of objects. And essentially, objects are things. So we use code to try and represent real-world things. Now, some of the key benefits of doing this include modularity, the ability to hide information, it promotes code reuse, simply because when you write code as objects and have them representing things, well, you can then reuse those things in programs uh, further on down the line. It also improves debugging and testing. Uh, one of the reasons for this being that because um, we attempt to make things so modular, um, we're very specific about what a class or an object does. So, for instance, we would create an object to, um, say, represent a shirt in a store. If we have any issues with that shirt object, well, we know that the um, information or the definition for that shirt is contained in one place. Likewise, um, any operations that may be performed, in, say, in our imaginary store, that too would be um, managed in one place. So again, if we run into any issues when it comes to debugging and testing, we'll have a pretty good idea, depending on the types of errors that we might run into, where to look to um, fix these errors. Now, some of the languages that are included under the umbrella of object-oriented programming languages include uh, Java, uh, Microsoft C-sharp and F-sharp. We also have C++ and uh, Perl version 5 is also an object-oriented language. Now, the two key terms that you need to understand are objects and classes. And like I said, objects are essentially things or code representations of real world items. And classes are where we create the definition for those things or the blueprint, if you will. So we map out what the object is or it isn't. Uh, what it can or can't do in a class definition, and then we create objects based on that class definition or the blueprint, if you will. And then we have this concept of abstraction, and abstraction refers to creating classes that are so general and they may contain methods without any particular um, implementation. So if we think of, say, something like a plant, well, that's a pretty general type of thing. Uh, now, we have, you know, uh, flowers and trees and shrubs um, and grasses, but those things are all plants. So we can take that abstract concept of a plant and actually create a code representation of it, and then from that, we can derive specific types of plants. And then there's this notion of polymorphism. And essentially, polymorphism means that no matter how much things change or get derived in an object-oriented language, we'll still be able to figure out what type of object that is. Now, another key feature in object-oriented programming languages is this notion of inheritance. Now, we talked a bit about abstract classes. Well, if we were to create an abstract class, say, to represent a plant, then we would derive from that class and create something more specific or more suited to our purposes, like a class to represent a tree. And we would say that the tree is derived from or inherits from its parent class which in this case would be the plant. And so we can pass on certain uh, characteristics or behaviors uh, through inheritance to child classes. And then we have encapsulation. And encapsulation essentially means that um, you're only letting people interact with what they need to uh, when it comes to your objects. So you're encapsulating some information or much of the information, which basically means you're hiding uh, the inner workings of your uh, class definitions and objects from access by users. 